Hey friends, it's Sarah Baldwin from Bella Luna Toys and I hope that I'm here with you live this Sunday for my first Sunday with Sarah live. I'm so excited to do this. Um, it's, I love connecting with all of you. It's always so impersonal sometimes through email and messages, but this is an opportunity to connect with me right here, right now. And thank you to all of you who have sent in so many great questions that I look forward to answering tonight. And you can keep answering, asking your questions by leaving a comment below this video. Um, before we do that, welcome. If you don't already like Bella Luna Toys Facebook page, I hope you'll do that now by clicking the like button at the top of the page. And if you've appreciated the posts on our page, I post a lot of links to articles and inspirational quotes, you can be sure to always receive our posts as well as future live events by clicking the button to the right of the like button that says following and and Ethan what does Ben say? It allows you to choose an option of whether you want to see That's the right. posts first. You can, what, do you remember exactly what it says? Choose? See posts first. See posts first. Um, you click that option to see our posts first to make sure that um, our posts always come up in your news feed. So that was Ethan Roney who I was talking to. He's a wonderful young man and who's been an intern from the University of Maine who's been helping me this summer and helping me navigate this new uh, technology and social media. So thank you so much for Ethan to help me get this off the ground. Hopefully next time I'll be able to do it by myself. But um, if you're out there, leave a comment and say hi. And what time is it where you are? We're here on the East Coast on the beautiful coast of Maine. Uh, it's 6 p.m. here. So um, whatever time it is where you are, thank you for making the time to join me tonight. We're planning to go about an hour and to stop around 7. And Due to the, the number of questions that have already come in, I know I'm not going to have time to answer them all tonight, but I will save each and every one of them, read them, and get back to you either in a, um, in a future live event or Sunday with Sarah video or on my blog. Um, so keep those questions coming. Everything working, Ethan? Yep. So it's 5 p.m. in Texas, where Sarah C. is. Hi, Sarah C. Aubrey S. is in Iowa, and it's 5 p.m. there as well. Well, welcome to Midwesterners. So I wanted to start tonight. This was a really great question that I got from Karen, and it's a topic that I've been wanting to discuss on my blog for a really long time, and it's about boys and gunplay. And Karen wrote, how do you channel boys' interest and fascination for weapons like swords and guns? Well, such a great question. And, and I know as a young mother of two boys, I struggled with the same question myself. Um, and through my years of parenting two boys and through many years as a kindergarten teacher working with a lot of preschool boys, um, I've seen it in action. Um, it seems like many boys just come hardwired for gunplay and weapon play, no matter how peaceful a household they may come from. And even if they haven't been exposed to violent movies. And psychologists think that indeed um, they may be wired this way because as we have evolved from hunter and hunting and gathering societies, men typically were the ones who were out with their bows and arrows um, catching dinner for survival method. And it may be just something that's been passed down uh, for survival reasons. Now, I remember when my firstborn son, Harper, was a baby, and I'd be at the park holding him, and I'd see all these rambunctious older boys, preschoolers and five- and six-year-olds, playing guns and being very rambunctious. And I turned up my nose and I thought, oh, my son will never be like that. I'm not, you know, I'm going to protect him from media and um, that kind of talk and that kind of play. Well, 
fast forward a few years, and once he got to preschool, he was playing guns and shooting with all the other boys, um, which is uh, that, that uh, my idea was quickly shattered by the reality of, of the way most boys, not all, come wired. Um, you know, parents can get very worried when their child starts playing guns. And it's not just boys. Girls play guns, too, and shooting games, especially in this day and age when there are almost daily reports of gun violence and mass shootings. Uh, it, it can be very disturbing when we see our children playing shooting games. Um, but guns for children are an expression of power. And if you think about it, a young child is apt to feel very powerless in his or her world, being told constantly by adults, by parents and teachers, what they can and cannot do. And it can get very frustrating. And it can lead to feelings of anger. So it's quite natural that a child, a powerless child, would want to pick up a stick and pretend to shoot you. Um, the children have very little knowledge at this age of really what killing means or or, um, or death. So don't freak out when when your child starts um, wants to start playing games or weapon games. Um, it's important to remember that generations of children have grown up playing shooting games or, or spent their childhoods playing shooting games. You know, there's cowboys and Indians or cops and robbers or Star Wars. Uh, it's natural, and most of us grew up to be not killers. Um, so relax a little is my advice. And know that even if you don't give your child uh, a toy gun, they will find anything that can become a gun. They'll build a gun out of Legos, or a kitchen spoon becomes a gun, or a sword, uh, and uh, sticks, of course. And even if you took away everything, their finger will still become a gun. Um, so it's, it's, uh, I think it's important to know that this play is natural. And my advice is not to disallow it, but to have certain rules around it. Um, the other thing to be aware of with gun play is children act out, work through their fears, things they've been exposed to, the things that scare them. They try to make sense of it and make sense of the world through their play. And so if a child does see a scary scene in a movie or a cartoon, it's quite natural that child is going to want to, to play that out to make sense of it. So by repressing it, by not allowing it, you're not allowing the child to work through all those feelings of fear around it. They need to be powerful in their play to overcome those fears. Um, but as you may be aware, in a lot of Waldorf schools, uh, we encourage sword play. And that's a frequent question, too. Why swords and not guns? Well, to my mind, sword play is a very different quality than gun play. It allows a child to engage his or her imagination more and think of times past, uh, knights and kings and queens and slaying dragons. It takes their imaginations to faraway lands. Um, so that's, that's one quality. Now, when I was a teacher, um, I did not have any kind of play guns in my classroom, but I did have wooden swords, like one here that I brought today. And the swords were kept in a closet. And a child had to ask for the sword uh, in order to play with it. And before he or she could play with it, he needed to be knighted. And there was a special little ritual we did so I would ask the child to first put on a cape, a silk cape, and then to sit on a special knighting bench. And I would hold the sword up and say to the child, let's, let's pretend we are um, going to knight you, Ethan. And to all my questions, I want you to respond, oh, yes. You ready? Ethan Roney, have you been good? Oh, yes. Have you been true? Oh, yes. Have you heard the stars singing in the sky? Here is your sword. Use it for right. And I tap him on one shoulder. To carry the light. And tap the other shoulder. 
not for some silly quarrel or fight. And then I would hand him the sword, which has a very different quality when you ask a child to take the sword, to uphold it for the true and the good. Now, of course, it will eventually involve devolve into into fighting with it but our rule in the classroom was you cannot touch another person's body with the sword if you wanted to play sword fight you'd hold both ends and kind of stick play like this um, outside I did allow gun play but there were certain rules too and that was you may not point a gun at another person you can point it at a tree you can point it in the sky. You can point it at an Im imaginary creature, but not at another person. So, um, as a parent, uh, you're, you know, it's it's up to you how you your comfort level and your rules about guns. If you do decide to give your child a toy gun, please, please uh, do not give them something that's realistic looking. Um, I'm sure you all know this, and we've all heard the very sad, tragic stories of children who were shot by police officers because they were wielding uh, a toy gun that looked real and was mistaken for a real gun. Um, we sell something we call a cork bow. It's wooden. Oops. And it's, you know, it, it has... Uh, a trigger that you pull, but it's more like a little crossbow. It shoots a cork, and it will also shoot felt balls. We don't have those on the website yet, but we're going to offer felt balls as, as ammunition that won't hurt anyone, but can satisfy that urge. And they actually shoot quite far. <laughs> um, and children who come into our store uh, love this. It's very popular. That can satisfy the need. Um, without resorting to, you know, all the, the, the plastic toy guns um, that are so widely available. Um, and then it's, it's also important as your children get older to let them know your feelings about guns. Um, for children uh, three, four, up to, you know, five or six, we want to teach the children that the world is a good place, that it's a safe and loving place. So we don't want to instill them with too many facts or fears about the, the really horrific damage and death that, that guns can cause. Um, but you might want to let them know that you know real guns are, are dangerous. And this is play, and this is, this is fantasy. Um, but uh, real guns are very dangerous, and that they should never touch one if they see one. And as they get older, you, you know, after six or seven, um, you might want to be a little more specific about your feelings. And that is, you know, that the mommy and daddy, you know, we, we believe guns are dangerous and we choose not to have them in our house. Or you might come from a family, you know, that, that enjoys hunting or, or shooting for sport. And if you have guns, you know, make sure your child knows they're very dangerous and that you, the gun owners in your family, have been specially trained in their safety and their safe use and they're kept locked up at all times, and I hope they are if you have them. Um, and uh, let them know your feelings about that. And then finally, I do think there's a direct correlation between violent images in the media, what children see, and as I said earlier, if they see it scary, they're going to play it out. The children are imitative. They're going to imitate what they see. So if you're concerned about gunplay, ask yourself, are they being exposed um, to violence on, in, in cartoons, video games? Um, if they're playing with your iPhone, what are they looking at? Um, so uh, try to limit their exposure to such uh, violence if, if you can. I hope that helps answer your question some. Uh, have there been any comments, Ethan, on this topic or questions? Um, no. Uh, I want to move on to, uh, I see that uh, Georgina, is, she commented from Philadelphia. Um, if you want to go straight to her question, she asked about the autism spectrum in Waldorf. Oh, okay. Hi, Georgina. 
Thanks for watching. That's another really great, great question that I get asked all the time. And I'm afraid I don't have an easy one-size-fits-all answer. Um, as you probably know, there's a wide spectrum of children on the autism spectrum, from very mild to very severe. Um, there are some cases where a child on the spectrum can fit in and reap all the benefits of a Waldorf education. Some children's needs are so great that they can't be met by the school or the teacher. And please know that, that each school and teacher um, is different and their resources are different. I believe in this day and age that there are so many children coming in with so many kinds of special needs and so many needs have been identified. Um, all children have some kind of learning difference. Um, we all do. Um, but if you are considering Waldorf education for your child, it's really important to talk to the school, talk to the administration, find out if there are specially trained Waldorf remedial teachers. I was going to say, I feel like every teacher in training now should also have an extra year of remedial training and working with children with special issues because they're so prevalent today. But not all teachers have. So you want to find out from the school, um, is the, the teacher for the class your child might be entering, what is his or her comfort level, and, um, and uh, does the school have any special resources, a special teacher would be willing to come in. If not, would the school be willing to let you bring in an aide to accompany the child if that's necessary? I've worked with children who had occupational therapists who would um, come once a week and give me as a teacher suggestions and guidance. They'd come in and observe and, um, and that can be really helpful to work in partnership, the parent and the teacher and, and the um, OT. Um, and finally, sometimes a school just has to say, we are so sorry, we don't think we can meet your child's needs. And that is truly heartbreaking. I've, I've been through it. The school doesn't want to tell this to a parent. Parents don't want to hear it. Every school that I've known, every teacher I've known wants to say yes and wants to welcome the child. But sometimes we have to be realistic with ourselves and say, it may not be in the child's best interest to have him here. He or she needs something more than we can give him and would be better served elsewhere. So it's important to know that might be the outcome and to be accepting of that. And you can always bring Waldorf influences at home to your home life. And maybe you can work with a school to take advantage of festivals there or, or be involved in the school community even if, if your child is not enrolled. Um, so I hope that helps. It's a great question. Thank you and, and good luck on your journey. Another question from Zoe from Puerto Rico. Hi um, Zoe. She wants to know what is the main difference between Waldorf and Montessori education? Okay. I'm not sure if every I've got a little mic on, so I'm not sure if um, if you can all hear Ethan's question. But Zoe from Puerto Rico writes and wants to know the difference between Montessori and Waldorf education. And that's another common question. Um, first of all, oh, and I think Connie Manson, are you tuned in? Say uh, yes. Hi, Connie. Connie Manson is another Waldorf teacher, very experienced teacher, who I actually did my teacher training with uh, years and years ago. And, um, and Connie, I believe, wrote her thesis, her master's thesis, comparing Montessori and Waldorf education. Is that true? Connie, is that true? Yes? Um, so she might have some, something to add as a comment. Let me tell you my take, what I usually tell parents, and then we'll see if Connie has anything to add. Um, the big difference in my mind, especially in early childhood, is the emphasis that Waldorf education places on the imagination and imaginative play. Uh, Maria Montessori was a scientist and 
her approach is a little more scientific and methodical. Um, the child's activities are called work in a Montessori classroom, where is in a Waldorf classroom, it's all about play. Um, I will just share with you my observations as a Waldorf teacher when I went to visit a, a Montessori school, the differences that struck me. But first I want to say both educational systems are excellent. They both address the whole child, kind of head, heart, and hands, or Maria Montessori also recognized the spiritual being of the child, just as Waldorf education does. So they both aim to educate the whole child. Um, but some of the differences I noticed on my visit, um, there are lots of activities in a Montessori classroom um, that are kept on trays, on shelves, and I saw children take them out, and they're to be played with in a certain way, and the child does the task and puts it back on the tray and freely chooses the next activity. Um, I noticed a lot of children kind of, it was very individualized and not social. And to me, that struck me as a big difference. In Waldorf, and we're talking about, I'm talking about early childhood here now because I'm, that's my area of expertise. Um, but, um, so there's a lot of independent activity. Even the children, when they had snack in the Montessori classroom, decided when they wanted their snack. And I saw children eating alone, sitting at a table, eating by themselves. In a Waldorf classroom, kindergarten classroom, for instance, the snack or meal is the big part of the morning, and children come in and they help chop vegetables. So they're doing the same kind of activity and work. You'll see children chopping vegetables in a Montessori classroom. Um, um, in a Waldorf classroom, they're all doing it for the benefit of the group and for each other and the fruit of their labor at the end of the morning is sitting down and eating a snack together. And the way play is designed, it's, it's, it's very, it's, the social is very important. Children playing together and negotiating with each other, working out their differences, learning to share, learning manners. Um, um, one more example from what I saw, one of the activities in the Montessori classroom I observed was a child uh, had a, a grater, like a cheese grater, and a bar of soap, like ivory soap. And she grated and grated and grated, which is a wonderful activity that's building fine motor skills. And then she mixed all the soap she had grated with water and made a big bowl of bubbly water and experienced that. And, oh, I know, she, she beat it with an egg beater, another great activity and exercising the child's will. And she had a big bowl of bubbly water, and then she went to the bathroom, dumped it all out, cleaned it up, and put it all away. Those are all really great um, activities for children. And then what struck me was the difference in my classroom. Children use a grater, and they grate carrots for our snack. And children use an egg beater to beat eggs to make a birthday cake when it's a child's birthday. So the difference to me is that in Waldorf we're using tools, real tools, for a real purpose, for their intended purpose, and not just for busy work. We're doing it for an, an end result, which is usually a, um, a snack or meal we share together. Um, I'm wondering, has Connie added anything yet? Feel free to chime in, Connie, and any Montessori educators out there, please feel free to, uh, to add your two cents as well. Um, and, but anyway, just to close that up, just to say that they're both excellent forms of education. I have many dear, wonderful friends who are Montessori teachers, and if you don't have a Waldorf school in your area, but you do have a Montessori school, um, lucky you. And um, they're just, uh, there's some similarities and there are differences. And uh, another similarity is that in Montessori, you'll typically see a lot of wooden and natural toys, quality toys, as like we use in Waldorf education. So Connie posted an article for people to visit instead of you doing a great job. <laughs> um, but did you 
people want to learn more about the differences and similarities between these two, and would you recommend that they go visit the article that Connor posted? Okay. Again, if you didn't hear Ethan, um, can you hear Ethan when he's talking? Let me know if I need to repeat what he's saying, because I've got the mic. But what Ethan said was, Connie posted a link to an article um, citing the differences. And um, so anyone who wants more information can click on that link. Thank you so much, Connie, for, um, for sharing that. Melissa said that they, they can hear me. They can hear. OK, maybe just speak up a little. Sure. When all right, should I go back to one of the... Yeah, why don't we go to, I think I saw Sarah C. Um, she is online listening to us. Um, Sarah asks about um, letter work and phonics. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, hi, Sarah. Thanks for sending your question in advance, and thanks for tuning in live. Um, Sarah wrote, I'll repeat again, would you recommend letter work or phonics for a four-year-old child? If so, how should I go about it? What is your take on uppercase versus lowercase learning? This is another question I get asked a lot. My advice when it comes to teaching children to read or when you have a child who's showing some interest in reading is uh, 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 a saying I learned in La Leche League when I was a young mother. And it was offered in terms of weaning, and that expression was, don't offer, don't refuse. So at the age of four, some children are, children's brains are developing, and they're getting ready to do the decoding work. Um, and many, many, I'd say most, um, are not. So, but at four, it's, it's um, normal for a child to start um, developing an interest in letters, and they might want to know how to spell their name, or they might want to write a simple word. Writing usually precedes reading, I would say, always. Um, so if, if a child is showing interest in letters and says, Mommy, how do I spell cat? I would not refuse it, because you've heard that in Waldorf education, it's harmful to teach children to read too early. I would give them just what they're asking for and, and no more. Um, a lot of parents, I think, will hear that. Oh, she's, she wants to spell. She wants to know how to spell cat. I need to break out the workbooks now and let's, let's teach phonics. Um, but by your child is your teacher and um, will let you know just how much he or she needs. So be attuned to that and answer their questions, um, but let it unfold gradually. These are the magic early years when your child gets to play in that magical, imaginary world of childhood that is over in such a flash. And there are going to be years ahead of learning to read and sitting at a desk and learning to write. But being able to be outside in nature and playing and making up stories um, is precious time, and so I would advise not taking away too early from that. And if, if a child is not yet ready to learn to read, and it doesn't mean they're not intelligent, it can be very bright, it's just uh, a development that has to happen in the brain. It happens at different ages. And if your child's not there yet, and too often in too many public school and mainstream classrooms, they're pushing reading earlier and earlier. And if a child's not ready, it's going to stress them out. It can cause anxiety. And if a child's in a classroom being taught to read before she's ready, it can lead to thoughts that I'm not, I'm not smart, I'm dumb, and when it's not true at all, the child's just young. So my advice is be gentle with it, let it unfold, and don't offer more than your child is asking for. I hope that makes sense. We have a comment from Ann R. Um, she was going back to the Montessori education, and she said that uh, Montessori environments also foster uh, working together in a community. Um, okay, that's, that's great to hear. And I want to emphasize that I, I'm just telling you what I observed, and I am not an expert on Montessori education. I have great respect for Montessori educators. And I'm sure I was there on one day, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there are opportunities 
um, for community. I know there's opportunity. I mean, I know they're all about community. So thank you, Anne, for adding that. And Connie also wanted to chime in with that. Um, the play, the storytelling, the time outdoors, all is a building and foundation for reading. Yes, that's right. Yes, uh, everything we do is, is a foundation for reading. Children in Waldorf early childhood classroom, they are singing songs and they are hearing verses and repeating them every day. That's all language skills. They're hearing stories and we don't water down the language. Um, their vocabularies tend to be way ahead of their peers because of the rich language that they're hearing, which is the natural way to, to, to teach language. And, and all of that in their play and negotiating, and it's all helping them learn. By the time they get to grade school, they're going to be ripe and ready for learning to read and already with having these rich spoken skills and vocabularies. Thanks, Connie. Yeah, we'll, we'll move on to another question, um, but if you guys have any live questions that you'd like to be answered, please post them in the comments. Um, but we're just going to move on now to a question um, from, um, uh, from Lori S., which is a similar question to what we had spoken about. Um, but she wants to incorporate Waldorf education into a Montessori classroom for three to six year olds, especially the daily livings. Um, again, I'm not sure that I'm the best person. Um, maybe Anne could uh, have something to add here, but you certainly, I would certainly advocate for rhythm. Rhythm, if you're not familiar with the concept in, in a Waldorf Early Childhood Classroom, is um, there is a certain order to the day and to the week and to the, the seasons, the rhythm of the day, the rhythm of the week, and the rhythm of the year. And it is so helpful to children um, it, knowing what comes next. Children can have a lot of anxiety when life is unpredictable and one day is different from the other and, and not knowing what to expect next. So in a Waldorf early childhood classroom, there's usually the teacher has a rhythm that's often posted outside the door. We come in, we take off our shoes, and we put on our slippers. Then we go to the snack table and help with snack. And then it's free play time. And then it's um, rest time. And then that's followed by circle time. And then that's followed by snack. And then that's followed by outdoor time. And then children come in from outdoors and have a story. The rhythm can vary from classroom to classroom. But then children know what happens next in, in the flow of a day. And I found as a teacher it was extremely helpful to um, for me, am I planning to to instead go, what am I going to do today and have to be creative every day? It's like, oh, this is you know, the rhythm of the day is formed. And the rhythm of the week would be a certain artistic activity. Um, for instance, we paint on Mondays. We model with beeswax on Tuesday. Uh, we do bread baking on Wednesday and so forth. And, and so children, young children, and under six, usually don't know how to read a calendar, and the days of the week are meaningless abstractions for them. What does Wednesday mean? What does Thursday mean? But they know that bread day follows soup day, and painting day is next, and that's how they start referring to the days of the week. Um, so I feel like bringing that, whether you bring that awareness of rhythm into your home life, or to a Montessori classroom, or to a public school classroom, I know firsthand that, that rhythm is a benefit to, to children and families and can really mitigate a lot of daily conflict. So I hope, hope that helps. Yeah, Connie wanted to chime in that there are Montessori teachers who have incorporated a time and space for free play. Having a dress-up corner with soft dolls and a play kitchen has been done successfully. Wonderful. That's great to hear. Yes. Yeah, that was something else that I'd meant to add that uh, in a Waldorf classroom, imagine a play, dress up play, so important. And the play kitchen area, so much goes on in, in, in that little corner of the room. Um, I think those are wonderful 
elements to add to a Montessori classroom if you can. I have I have a couple. Of, oh, do you have another live one? Yeah, I have two actually. So the first one is from Justine from Australia. <gasps> Hi, Justine. What time is it there? Um, About twelve hours ahead. So it must be early morning. Her Good morning. Is about um, is there any advice on where to start with introducing Waldorf homeschooling to my six year old daughter and four year old son? Okay. And Justine says it's eight thirty five in the morning. Oh, good morning, all of you in Australia. Um, so, a six year old and a four year old. Um, Um, if it, it depends how newly six the child is. Um, ideally, ideally, in, in, uh, Rudolf Steiner, the founder of Waldorf Education, felt that um, grade school formal learning should begin at seven. And a lot of recent research, brain research, has borne that out. Children under seven need to be moving. Their brains are developing when they're jumping and running and and balancing and and so play. My feeling is that you know, a six-year-old who can spend another year playing, that is a real gift, and it's actually going to aid their future learning. So um, can you tell me in a comment if, when your child turns six? Later six. So he's later six, so probably wanting to start first grade. Um, so there, there are a lot of um, resources for for homeschoolers and Waldorf homeschoolers, and they'll give you a lot of guidance. But um, you could really tail your days to toward that um, toward your six-year-old. And if you're going to do like have a main lesson in the morning or introduce the alphabet, um, your four-year-old is usually probably happy to participate. And but at this young age, still there's so much to be done in life, and school and life. I had a couple of years homeschooling, as some of you may know. Took a break from our Waldorf school and um, homeschooled my own two children. I learned so much during those years about how children learn. Um, but uh, So daily life will have to go on. Meal preparation and the laundry and doing chores and errands and making all of that a learning experience and involving both your children in it and finding perhaps, you know, two hours a day in the morning to do your your main lesson work with, with your six-year-old. Um, Christophorus Homeschool Resources is one of my favorite resources uh, for Waldorf homeschoolers. Um, I've got, if you check out my blog, uh, I've, I've done past videos on that. That's something to have a look at. I will post the link um, after this event is over to, to, uh, to their website. Um, I have a couple questions here that people wrote in advance that I wanted to respond to. Is it a Melissa um, B? Let me, um, I have, uh, I wanted to respond to Elizabeth oh, S. Yes, <laughs> There's, um, Elizabeth S. wanted to know what ages does Waldorf education cover? As a homeschool family, what would we be doing once the children get to grades five to eight in high school? So to Elizabeth, uh, I wanted to say most Waldorf schools in the U.S. go through eighth grade. There are a growing number but, uh, of schools that do go up through high school, through 12th grade. There's a whole Waldorf high school curriculum, but um, there, there certainly aren't as many high schools as there are grade schools. Um, and there are many curriculum guides and resources available for, for Waldorf homeschoolers for the middle school years from fifth grade through eighth grade. Um, so Christopher's homeschool resources, their grade by grade uh, curriculum I think ends around fifth grade, but she does have a Waldorf curriculum overview for the middle school years. And I think that's a really good starting place. Um, a lot of books recommended to for the curriculum for that year. For instance, in sixth grade, it's Roman history. Uh, it'll give you a lot of good ideas as a, a jumping off point. Uh, live education 
is another uh, resource that does go up through eighth grade that was written by two Waldorf teachers. It's very true to Waldorf education if you're really trying to give your child a, um, an experience close to what they would get in a Waldorf school. Um, Oak Meadow is very popular, highly regarded. Um, it's not pure Waldorf. It's definitely Waldorf inspired. Um, but uh, it's, it's not a true Waldorf experience if you're a purist. That said, a lot of parents prefer it because it really lays out lessons year by year, grade by grade, and not only goes up through eighth grade, but also goes up through high school. There are fewer uh, curriculum, curricula that's written for high schoolers because for one, by high school, Rudolf Steiner felt that High school students need to be taught by, by experts in their field. And so if you're going to homeschool through high school, um, my recommendation would be to, to find internships or mentors for your child to work with who are experts in their field. Um, there's a lot of online learning for, for um, high school, homeschool high schoolers. You could use those to learn the basic skills or the requirements they're going to need to fulfill to apply to college. Um, there's a great book called The Teenage Liberation Handbook by Grace Llewellyn. That's a really great book full of ideas for learning outside of the box during the high school years. Um, but also remember that high school years are really social years. That's when their peer group becomes more important. Um, then their parents becomes um, very influential. So you want to give them opportunities to socialize with other teens their age. If you can find groups of other homeschooled high schoolers, that's great. Do camping trips together. Um, make sure, you know, help them find, you know, interesting, motivated kids uh, to hang out with and really honor their need um, to socialize. So I hope that helps. Grace Llewellyn, um, it's, uh, I think that's a Welsh name, L-L-E-W-E-L-L-Y-N, and it's the Teenage Liberation Handbook, and I can post that too as a comment um, after this event. Oh, also, uh, check out waldorfwithoutwalls.com, that's Barbara Dewey's uh, 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 has been working for many, many years um, helping Waldorf homeschoolers. And she's got a good article there on um, the high school years um, that you might want to check out. It's waldorfwithoutwalls.com. And finally, one other suggestion is check out on Facebook. I'm not aware of any, but there must be groups of high school homeschoolers. If any of you are part of such a group, you could leave that in a comment. But find your community, and it can be very isolating when you're homeschooling, especially in the high school years when fewer people are doing it. But um, find families to connect with and to share resources with. Um, you want to move on to Jessica's question about the, the toys? Oh, Jessica and her six-month baby girl? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Jessica D. wrote, Hi, Sarah, we have a six-month-old baby girl. She's the first grandchild on both sides. We live in a very small condo. What sorts of toys do you think we should prioritize getting as she grows, and how do we gently make suggestions to the kinds of toys we'd like her to have from gift givers? This is another common question. Um, so... To answer the first part of your question, for a six-month-old baby, my I brought along my number one recommended toy for that age group. It's one of our best sellers. It's these nesting bowls from Germany made by Grimm's Spiel and Holtz, one of our favorite companies. Um, so a six-month-old baby will just hold them, and the texture on these is really nice. They're not painted. They're stained, so you can kind of feel the texture of the wood through. But as they grow and develop, these can be played with in so many ways. Um, when she gets a little more dexterity, she can nest them like they are or turn them over and build them into a tower. 
like so. And then they can be used for, the, the colors are in the order of the rainbow. They can be used for color identification and used for sorting. And as she gets even older, they can become little pieces in an imaginary setup. Um, that's one of my very favorite toys for a six-month-old. And it doesn't take up much space at all if you live in a condo. Um, other toys for that age, toys that nourish the senses like play silks. Like our mini, our mini play silks, our smaller version of our full-size ones that are so soft and silky that you can play peekaboo with them. And as they get older, they find more things to do with them. But at this age, in the young, early childhood years, we want to nourish their senses. And silk is, is so silky and natural and feels so good on the skin. Rudolf Steiner describe the young child as being wholly sense organ. That is, they are, the baby is learning about the world through all of their senses and thought that there were actually not five senses, but actually 12. Um, that's a whole other topic. But, um, but so Waldorf toys and the kind of toys we sell at Bella Luna Toys are toys that, that feel good and um, are going to nourish that sense of touch because think about it, baby doesn't just look at a toy and go, oh, stacking cups. There, it's like, what is this? They're going to smell it and they're going to taste it and put it in their mouth and chew on it and explore it with all their senses. So you want to give them things that, that feel good. Um, oh, and speaking of Sarah's silks, um, we do have a big giveaway going on. If you look at the post, just prior to, to this live event, it has all the details. We have partnered with Sarah Silks. And I am not Sarah of Sarah Silks. I get asked that all the time, and sometimes people presume that I make all the silk products we sell. I do not. That would be Sarah Lee and her company, Sarah Silks. Sarah Lee is a good friend and partner of Bella Luna Toys. We are proud to carry the complete line of, of Waldorf toys that she has developed. We think play silks are like the number one Waldorf toy, but it's all the ways they can be played with it and used for dress up and made into little rivers and play scenes. So we are giving away a full set, 17 play silks, one in every solid color, plus a bonus rainbow play silk, all in a basket, one lucky winner. It's a $287 value. It's the biggest giveaway we've ever done. So if you haven't entered that already, once this broadcast is over, you can click on the, um, go to the earlier post and uh, watch the video, the magical video uh, that Sarah Silks created showing all the ways that their, their play things can be played with. Leave a comment and uh, you'll, you'll see all the instructions for how to enter there. And be sure to like Bella Luna Toys and like Sarah Silks on Facebook. And if you're on Instagram, we'd love it if you would like us there too. And just want to repeat for anyone who's just tuned in midway at the beginning of the broadcast, I asked you if you haven't already liked our page to please like Bella Luna Toys page. And if you appreciate the posts, these live broadcasts and the information I've shared and the articles I've shared, be sure that we show up in your news feed. And you can do that by clicking the button to the right of the like button that says following, following. And there'll be options there and to prioritize uh, Bella Luna Toys in your news feed so that uh, you don't miss any of these events or giveaways. Um, thank you for that. Any more live questions, yeah, so Ethan? Yeah, one from Anne. Um, she asked, what, what do you consider important components in a three-year-old home and school environment? Okay, Anne wants to know, important components in a, for a three-year-old in a home and school environment. Ah, uh, a rocker board. <laughs> the Waldorf rocker board um, that we sell is... If you've followed me for any length of time at all, you may know it's my one very favorite toy that we sell. And if, um, if you're not familiar, it's just a curved piece of plywood about three feet long. And it can be played with in so many ways. Adults tend to look at it and you know, this is a toy. Um, they come into our store and well, what does it do? 
but a child will come in and they'll show you right away what you can do with it. You stand on it and you can balance on it. And it takes a lot of strength. And it's building their core strength and it's building a child's sense of balance, which we know is so important to brain development and learning. It was one of the other senses that Rudolf Steiner talk about, talked about in the 12 senses, the sense of balance. And they can flip it over, and it becomes a bridge they can walk over. It's strong enough to hold up to a 250-pound adult. Um, we, it, it, we have them in the store, and people at Bella Luna Toys, sometimes when we just need a break and need to get away from our desk, we'll get and stand and rock on the rocker board. You can put one end up on a coffee table or a play stand and it becomes a slide, it becomes a bridge, and children will drive their toy cars and trucks over it. Um, they'll crawl under it, they'll put it on the floor and lie on it, it becomes a cradle, it becomes a doll cradle, and three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds will all play with it. When I, I brought two into my classroom to start with when um, I first discovered them, and as soon as free playtime started, children go right to them, grab them. I got two more, and they were always the most played with toy in the classroom. Um, so that would be my top recommendation for a three-year-old. Um, a little play kitchen is another great, um, great idea that really invites imaginative play. Play stands. Um, you can, if you don't have a full playroom, you could just section off a corner of the room with two play stands and with a little play kitchen, a little play table in there and sets of dishes that invites um, make-believe role-playing and social play. Um, those are the first things that come to mind. We have so many things for that age group, but those, when I think of essentials, those are the items that I think of. I hope that helps. And how much time do, oh my gosh, this hour has just flown by. Do you want to move on to Amy's question? Okay, uh, do I have that one? Yes, I'll have a place for children ages three to six. Oh, puppet, 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 oh yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you for reminding me. And thank you, Amy, for your question. And thank you, Connie, for being here for this question. Amy is looking for resources for little puppet plays for ages three to six. And Connie Manson, who's with us, is an expert in puppetry. That's the, her life's love and her life's work. Her page is Starlight Puppets, S-T-A-R-L-I-T-E, Puppets. So be sure to like her page, too, and visit her website, because she's got some great resources, and she is the most beautiful teller of stories and puppet plays and has the most beautiful singing voice. Um, I was so lucky to uh, do my student teaching with, with Connie and have her as an influence as a puppeteer. Um, so we sell, we sell a number of books at Bella Luna Toys um, with, with puppet stories. My book, Nurturing Children and Families, has a number of short little puppet plays that are good for younger children. Um, they're good for all, all ages, you know, kindergarten, but I pick them specifically for play groups with, you know, for two and three year olds. Um, three to six year olds, uh, you can really take any story and make it a puppet play, whether it's a fairy tale or a folk tale or a nature story. Um, and if you're not familiar, those of you who aren't familiar with Waldorf puppetry, we're not talking about hand puppets, but most often table puppets. It could even be a little wooden um, figure, from our, uh, like our Ostheimer figures, that we have people figures and animals. Um, could be finger puppets. Um, but you, you just take a story and act it out for the children with whatever type of puppets, or it could be handmade table puppets that we use in Waldorf education, which is kind of a head with just a cylindrical body that move very simply. But um, so, so uh, the, I think every household and every teacher should have a copy of the complete Grimm's fairy tales. Uh, we sell a, uh, an edition at Bella Luna Toys, a translation that is used by many Waldorf teachers uh, um, who like this particular 
translation. Now be aware that not every Grimm's fairy tale is appropriate for all ages. So I've been meaning for some time to post on my blog um, a list of de fairy tales by age that are developmentally appropriate. So look for that soon. Once I post it on my blog, I'll put a link to it on our Facebook page. Um, but, uh, and we also carry a book called Tell Me a Story, which is a compilation of stories collected, favorite stories from Waldorf teachers all over the world. So you might find inspiration uh, from the stories in there. And our Windstones series, seasonal series, we've got spring, summer, fall, and winter. These are collections, again, collected by Waldorf early childhood teachers of stories, songs, verses, um, and puppet plays by season. And when I asked Connie this morning about what her recommendations are, would be Bronya Zaligman. Oh boy, I always butcher her name. Um, I can't ask Connie because I can't hear her. The pr 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 pronunciation uh, Z A H L I G E N. She's Eastern European. Bronya is B R O N. B-R-O-N-J-A. Um, her collection, A Lifetime of Joy. And uh, that's one of Connie's favorite resources. And stories in uh, Let Us Form a Ring by Nancy Foster. Uh, Nancy's, those were invaluable to me um, as an early childhood teacher. Uh, Nancy's Let Us Form a Ring and the follow-up, Dancing as We Sing, I think both of these resources, A Lifetime of Joy and Nancy Foster's Let Us Form a Ring, Dancing as We Sing, are available from the Waldorf Early Childhood Association of North America's website, also known as WECAN, W-E-C-A-N. And uh, if you go to their website, I'll post a link here later, uh, they have a, a bookstore and you can find lots and lots of resources. Um, that will answer a lot of these questions that have been asked today on early childhood, lots of resources of stories and um, books on teaching and so much more. So I think, are we out of time? Yep, we have 6.57. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here tonight. This was fun for me. I hope it was for you. I wish you were right here in my... In my, uh, I'm in my studio now. I um, rented a space. It became so much work to try to set up space in my store to do my videos that um, I've rented this space just uh, for these kinds of events to do my videos. And I hope to do more of these. I'd love your feedback on it. You know, what could I do better next time? What did you like? Uh, and I'm sorry I didn't get to all your questions. I will keep them all and I will do my best to answer them in the future. So again, don't forget to enter our Sarah Silks giveaway. We're going to pick a winner on August 3rd. You still have time. Be sure to like us on Facebook if you haven't already. And uh, thanks for tuning in. I'll let you know when we do it again and hope to see you next time. Have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>